tend to uh, weave together a lot of different frameworks lately. Um, I, I, I use design thinking uh, regularly in my work. Um, I also um, have been exploring more ways that I can apply systems thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I read something really interesting um, recently about a framework for problem solving. And so it's kind of becoming another thing that I'm sort of um, weaving on top of my use of design thinking. And I also um, have studied um, uh, program evaluation, so evaluative thinking. So that's kind of another thing that I add to the mix. So um, those topics really interest me. I've gotten the sense that this space would be an opportunity to engage um, that have similar interests. And um, when I first attempted to connect with the community, um, it was uh, when I was in a different position and um, I just didn't have the capacity to fully participate, but some of that's changed. So um, I love to hear more from others about what brings them to this community. And hopefully that'll give me a better sense of uh, ways that I can engage with this community. Okay, thank you. So before we, we move on that topic, I propose that we move virtually to the uh, couches that are on the top of this uh, room, like the white couches, if it's fine for you, so it, it will feel a bit more comfortable, right? <laughs> Makes all the difference. <laughs> oh, here. Ah, and I, I sorry, I will move the piano. Here we go. Because I hear the piano, it's it's not that it's uh, annoying or, or what, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not in the mood of. <laughs> you can pour yourself a drink as well, Tamika. Yeah, you can click it on the table and it um, on the plate. Like a beer. Yeah. I I'll, I have tea in real life, so I'm gonna pretend it's you know similar color. So same uh, same drink. I have take take. Likewise. So. <laughs> there you go. Here. <laughs> Okay. Oh, now it claps. Wow. We... This yeah. is becoming more and more immersive. I think, <laughs> yeah, a year ago we had our glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So, and I, I, love, I love to use the gallery view. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have like a four squares together a button. I don't know if you see that. And if you click on that, it, it puts people near you in a in gallery view, and then it's easier to see who's speaking. So. Yeah, that's the way that I'm set up. So I see all of our faces on the couch okay. with videos. <laughs> cool. Then, uh, so I, I, I don't know, I, I won't be the best one to answer the question why I'm here, uh, probably. So, uh, well, I, I said at the beginning, like to to have like interesting discussions with interesting people, and um, and yeah, to increase the way I can see opportunities to think differently and yeah, increase my knowledge in general. So you're helping me achieving that. Uh, I don't know who's want to share about your experience so far and. I brought you there. No, I can do it. I mean, I've been part of this community for quite long now, come to think of it. Mm. Uh, I don't even know. When did I start coming to this community? I think it was in at the beginning of 2021. So yes. I'm, I'm a veteran here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the reason I keep on coming is because of these discussions that, you know, you, you were mentioning all these different concepts uh, within design thinking, philosophy, information theory. It, it could be anything as long as, you know, we, we, we just want to share something and learn from each other. It's not always the case that we are experts in something, but we're all uh, open minded and uh, really curious to learn more. It's uh, the, the problem with expertise is that sometimes you don't question it enough. So when you come here, actually, it's nice that you can ask basic questions like, but what is design thinking? So, or what is the role of, the, uh, of a designer, which really troubled us for such a long time. <laughs> uh, but I've learned a lot uh, since coming 
for these events and really pairing it up, inspiring me. Sometimes I take a, a book or two and I just go and skim through them, giving the recommendations, a thought, maybe writing something. So yeah, it's, it's fairly productive, but in a different way, in a more unpredictable and unbounded way, which is, uh, it's nice to have. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a veteran, but I'm uh, probably a, a, a big frequent um, return uh, comer to uh, the space. Um, I'm uh, one of the things that kind of attract me to come back uh, again and again is um, mostly because this this community has um, kind of this f philosophy that an open ended discussion um, can can lead to uh, certain, you know, magical insights, so to speak. Like, it's not necessarily better insights or, or superior, but there's a sense that there is no longer this hierarchy that you are used to uh, in your own world. And that, um, that kind of jars you a little bit, but at the same time, it challenges you and to, 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 um, uh, think a little bit differently. And I think that's, um, you know, a special experiential effect too. So um, I'm not a designer. Um, I'm, you know, trained engineer, uh, technically, but I do think that, you know, there, there is not enough of this type of um, learning experience, so to speak, that, um, that uh, leads to uh, th th that 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 is used in a way that could uh, create value and contribute value in a in a productive sense. Um, yeah, and I think that there is more, a lot of opportunity to explore in this direction and to build, um, you know, a, a kind of like you create your own framework through experience. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, and in terms of how does does that happen? Like we have those kind of sessions here. Uh, usually we are not so many people <laughs> because it's hard to it's hard to entertain this kind of uh, you know informal conversation for everyone. Like it's it's not something that everyone is used to, and. Uh, it can be hard to follow sometimes and um, I, I don't know, like some, some people don't feel necessarily comfortable with the, inf the, the fact that it's really informal. So it's like some people don't just don't stick to the to the format, um, I would say. Um, and then we, we have the Slack channels that I don't know if you are on the Slack. I, I, I think you are, uh, Tamika. Um, yeah, so I... I, I I'm not a good Slack user. I just <laughs> I find Slack a little overwhelming. It feels yeah. like it's another thing throwing notifications at me. So I'm and in there. I think, I think I probably even forgot to download it to my new phone, quite honestly. <laughs> you, you, you're probably right. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, another uh, distraction uh, for some. For Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but it's one of the way we also share outside of those conversations like we continue some conversations some some even start in the slack and then move on this space some come from this space and move to the slack um and um and the last one is i try sometimes to uh some on some topics that i feel like i'm a bit more um i can do something with it i try to write about um and so we have the articles and so these these are the ways to interact with with the community, um, uh, and and we have like um, I think today we we have about two about two hundred people uh, officially in the community, but now in terms of participation we always see the same faces, <laughs> so it's about the yeah about the ten to 20 people, same people that, that tends to, uh, to, to attend to the, to the virtual, um, chalet and, uh, the community workshop. So, 
um, yeah, I don't know if it helps you to give a picture. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that was that was really that was really helpful. Um, thank you for the um, for getting for everyone sharing more of what brings you to the space and that reminder that it's it's quite informal. We we also have we have had in the past we we had more formal formalized um, sessions, especially when we like we we I remember we had the discussion about uh, what the rule of the of design in in solving complex problems, for instance, and that came from our discussions, from our informal discussions about the role of designers in general. And we said it could be interesting to to do something a bit more formalized, um, um, and invite more people to to think with us with us, you know, about this uh, this, this topic. Um, so this these are the kind of discussion that are one time events with a special uh, topic and we try to constrain it a bit more because we have more people so it's hard for everyone to you know to to participate so we try to find some kind of good compromises um, and we also had workshops so Diana and and crazy she's uh, she's not here today um, they they like to to invent new new approaches, new tools, and we, we use the, the community as a, as a, um, what's the term, a, a playground, basically. We, we, we use it as a, uh, as a test, um, well, a place where we can test ideas. So, um, yeah. I think we, we also really try to, let's say, uh, cultivate a habit of maybe more people sharing their tools or challenges mm -hmm. if they could come to, to the community we, we hope that this would be more occurring but sometimes uh yeah uh, it, there was some reluctance and i think people really enjoyed just dropping in and just having that sort of uh stream of consciousness kind of conversation but uh, I still think it's a, there is potential for just people to become a bit more active. But we see the difference now because remote has kind of shifted mm -hmm. to hybrid. A lot of people go into the offices. So they're not so keen on participating. They just maybe not don't have time. Now this time of the day has be, become, I don't know, going to work or coming back from work, which, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's a bit different. Um, but we have to keep through and see what's going to yeah. happen. I'm so, so curious. So one of the idea is to also open the space to everyone who wants to try things. So, Tamika, if you have a topic that is really important for you and you want to explore, we can also imagine to just do an event for that, like a, a community session just for that reason. Like we engage with mm. people interested with the same topic and you just increase the perspectives about the same topic. Like it gives, it, it's not the purpose of having an answer. It's more like having more ideas and more perspectives about it. It's one of the things we, we tried in the past and that that's, it usually brings more people because then you have a specific topic and it helps people to, you know, it, it's, it has an affordance to, to it. So it, it helps people to, to, to join more, more easily. So it's totally something we can do as well. Yeah, no, that that's good to know. Um, are are people comfortable if I kind of toss out like yeah. an idea to get some yeah. perspective on? Um, so I guess one thing that I've been thinking about, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I finished a book that I really liked. It's called um, Solvable, and so it was introducing. I don't know if anyone, any of you have read it, but it was introducing um, a framework for problem solving. Um, where the approach is essentially um, frame, explore, decide. And so it uses um, uh, a, sort of a storytelling approach as a suggestion for how to frame an initial problem, right? So think in terms of who's the hero, you know, what's the treasure that you're going after? What's the dragon that preve that's preventing you from getting to that treasure? And then based on that, um, exploring different possibilities where that exploration and, dis and, and decision step um, 
immediately, you know, got me thinking about um, the application of design thinking. I, I guess what I realized as I was, you know, kind of thinking about this approach to, to problem solving, um, it made me think about how one of the spaces where, um, in my experience with design thinking, that feels like it has the most variability is how people go through some sort of discovery phase to make sure that they understand um, a problem, who has it, right? All of those prerequisites before you go into ideation. And so I was thinking about the idea that the, um, the, the problem framing approach in this one model um, kind of fit nicely with some of the work involved in, in really approaching design thinking when you understand um, at a high level, what persona you're you're interested um, in further exploring a, a, a problem space for. So yeah, I guess I was just curious about any um, kind of reactions to that idea about, you know, um, kind of adding in another framework to really um, mm -hmm. help with uh, the, the discovery area of design thinking in particular. Or anything else about that that resonated? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I really like the, the way you you put it, and the, the, that you see, you know, this clarity between the design thinking, storytelling, and the, the problem framing. And I think you're actually right. This uh, discovery phase sometimes is kind of uh, taken away in the usual, you know, conversations about design thinking that you see promoted. want to give the practical method to achieve that kind of problem so uh, actually I'm, uh, I'm working in strategic design mm. so what that does it's actually it's creating this foundation this layer to rethink the fundamentals of uh, whether you need to solve a problem to frame it differently or to dissolve it altogether and to then to move throughout, throughout with design thinking and uh, you know it's a, it's quite a nice name for the community the fact that design and critical thinking so it has the both sides of the coin kind of placed together because these are the prerequisites of pushing you know the the what you know aside and taking it towards this unknown if uh, that's where you want to go and that requires extensive creative thinking where things are not always charted there's not always a process and you can't go with an outdated map so you kind of have to make your own as you move and uh but what's powerful, I think, what makes the discovery phase powerful is people working together. Like, you doing it yourself, if you're smart enough, yes, do it. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's really useful to articulate full thoughts. Uh, I think uh, design thinking appreciates it, but doesn't stress enough on how important it is to, to co-creation, to, to express ideas fully. So yeah, I like, I like the problem you're throwing out. <laughs> yeah. I tend to agree um, about the last point that design thinking does not, uh, you know, push that that much about co-creation. Um, I would say something I can see as potentially problematic with starting with the framing is um, is that you you could you you could bring like. Um, Hey Mark, you know, uh, you could already put some constraints about your understanding of the of the situation. Uh, like you never start from a, a blank slate. That we 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 can all agree on on that, right? Uh, but the the process of framing is something that I, I I do feel like needs to come along with the process of discovery, right? So, uh, this is not something that is especially well, I think well, what you're saying well is... described, well described in, in, you know, in standardized processes and, and tools because, because it's hard to describe something that is, you know, uh, that co-evolve uh, at, at the same time. Because what you want to do is like, you, of course, you start with something in mind because, because otherwise you, you would it be there trying to do something at the, in the first place, right? So you start with something, it's, it's not nothing, 
but then as soon as you can, you want to extend this understanding to something else, right? It's, it's not just your point of view because otherwise you don't even need all of those tools and, and stuff like that, right? So you want to do that, but then it, it, it means that the, you reframe whatever you are trying to understand at, at the same time, right? So this, this balancing feedback loop that you, needs to happen and yeah, I, 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 I still want to see something that describes well this, uh, but once you do it, you formalize it in a way that is necessarily somehow, you know, linear, right? So it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to not be prescriptive and be, and give clarity at the same time, you know, it's, uh, especially when it's something that needs to be done, like it's, uh, you know, an activity, right? So. Uh, there's some kind of contradiction here, but yeah, I, I, it's also always something that I try to to keep, you know, to keep in mind and be mindful when I, I to approach any any tool that um, um, not that like not arriving at this point of uh, you know uh, converging too too soon on something, right? Too early. So the challenge remains, how do you describe still problem framing without resorting to a philosophical dialectic of <laughs> overcomplicating the, the, the spectrum? Because <laughs> I think that's how to do it. Well, yeah, I, do it. Hearing, hearing Kevin, I, I guess I realized, um, so, so there, there's, there's probably a caveat in my thinking that I, that I didn't quite mention, right? So at least when I think about the way that my um, organization approaches design thinking, right? So it's all about design thinking at scale. It's all about co-creation, as you were describing. Um, is it uh, pronounced Diana? Okay. Um, so, so, so that part's there, but I guess what I was thinking is that it's almost, so, so, so just hypothetically, right? So let's say that we're interested in going um, embarking down this path because we really want to think about the unmet needs of a particular uh, type of customer, right? So we we start out with a super high level sense of persona, really more of a, a persona type, like one of our customer types. And so there's work to discover where that customer type is experiencing challenges. But one thing that I've observed is that it's not always clear within the design thinking framework as I see it, how to take um, an observation of a set of problems, right? And just take that extra step to kind of frame those problems a bit more. So um, one suggestion um, in the book that I was mentioning is the idea of using something that's a bit like um, an issue tree. So taking an opportunity to start to think about, okay, we observe that this problem's happening, why, right? And, and continuing to kind of pose that question because it might lead to some additional useful discovery that offers context before going into ideation. And so I, I think, Kevin, that the caveat is that to your point, right, it, it probably doesn't make sense to just start with this story right, about hero, dragons, and treasures, you, you have to identify the potential dragons, right, like the, the treasure as it makes sense to the hero, which hero you're focusing on. So the start of the discover phase and design thinking, I think, helps facilitate that. But there's a risk, I think, in jumping right from, well, we've observed a set of problems, right, how do we start, you know, to think about how to solve those problems, right? And so, sure, there's an experimental component. You can focus on coming up with a variety of different hypotheses, going through the work of, of deciding which ones, you know, to, to validate and test, right? But there might be some value in getting the whole group framing the problems that have been identified to lead to even better hypotheses right before you go ideating and prioritizing yeah increasing perspectives on the same on the same problem yeah mm -hmm. makes sense hmm. 
So I would say, um, you know, the first product before you um, even make an MVP is your story, right? And the emotional framing of your story um, is your signal to the rest of the world how much you value this idea or product. So in evolution or in nature, right, um, flowers, they develop their colors in order to attract pollinators and that's their survival mechanism is to be beautiful to attract pollinators right and so how much color you want to put in that has to be like a very honest thing that you have to answer for yourself and the thing is the the range that you get to pick is very huge because you can say you know this problem saves the world or you could say this is a very small problem. It's an issue ticket, right? Let's fix the issue ticket. Let's fix, you know, the low hanging fruit. Um, what I will say about like choosing which range to go with uh, would be that you have to be honest no matter what, because if you're not honest, then people can see through that. And the most honest way is actually to just be as naive as possible. <laughs> the, the naive Bayesian is the best possible position to take because it's the most honest. Because even if you screw up in communicating your message, you know, you miss a word or something, and or your message only gets 80% across, at least you sound human. Because if you, if you were pitch perfect in your delivery, sounding like a robot, nobody would get the message, right? It, it would have sounded like an ad. And then nobody would have, you know, pay attention to your uh, message. Now, the example that I want to give is this. Um, in the 1700s, um, there was a guy who was obsessed with uh, the, the seven bridges of Königsberg. And he, he wanted to figure out how to walk across each of these seven bridges just once. And these seven bridges connect two islands to two sides of a river bank, right? And so he wrote uh, a letter to, you know, now, you know, one of the most brilliant, you know, mathemat mathematicians of our history, right? Uh, Leonard Euler. And Euler first dismissed it. Like, this is a stupid problem, <laughs> right? Because he framed it in a very naive way. But, you know, being the genius that he was, he, he, he later... I mean, he was asked to prove, right, if it could be done or not. And improving is, you know, 10 orders of magnitude, magnitude harder than it is to, to just solve, right? Because, because it's easy to solve, but it's hard to prove. So he was asked to prove it. And so he actually had to invent graph theory in order to prove it, right? So it, it, it led from, so basically the idea behind it is that, you know, you're naive, um, question inquiry can lead to an amazing discovery at, you know with, with the right recipient and the right audience as long as it's well received and i think the last concept that i want to kind of bring up is the idea of straw man and steel man because um in our normal day-to-day -day lives in competition we're competing for attention and so it's very easy to fight your competition by straw manning them and saying, you know, you, you create a straw man version and analogy, attack that and then win, right? Because the objective is to win. But, you know, in these days, I follow a lot of billionaire investors because I'm an investor myself. And one of their one of their strategies to try to reach better subjectivity, right? Because you don't get objectivity, but you get better subjectivity is to steel man the opposite idea, right? And so when you, when you can bring a naive perspective and a naive telling, and then you ask somebody who has, who, who is, you know, well-grounded in the, you know, in, in logic and the ideas that you should probably want to steel man an argument, then you might actually get um, a pretty good result out of that. So that's all I wanted to add there. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And just a quick hello to Mark. <laughs> Thank you.
do you do you follow Mark because you you arrived right in the middle of the discussion so I, I don't know if it's clear for you what we are discussing not entirely but I kind of got the idea I mean <clears throat> from what Tamika said I kind of got the idea of this, this notion of framing prior to it's it's part of the understanding the ecosystem before you start solutioneering basically right so um, and also understanding problems as being of multiple orders right that, that if you that if you only scratch the surface of something that there may be a problem upstream of that that you need to discover and so working up the tree is kind of <clears throat> required although <clears throat> sometimes it's funny because i hear this and i'm like yeah isn't everybody doing that <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a weird yeah. weird thing but yeah no I, I really believe in understanding problems systemically right like looking at the ecosystem of what it is that that is out there um so that you can understand and that happens at multiple scales like that happens at the scale of a website if you look at the analytics and something is wrong on a given website that that problem may have started two or three screens before with poor wording for example or you know the inability to keep somebody from making an error you know, or bad onboarding or anything like that. So we spend a lot of time digging up backwards, even in specific instances, to make sure that we're addressing the right, the right problem. Uh, yeah. But it's, yep. it's not, it's sometimes not the easiest thing to explain to clients either. Right. Who jump right to like, make the button bigger, you know, mm. that kind of thing, like that everybody has heard. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, I think this, I think it happens at multiple scales and in multiple stages of the project. And so it's really good to be aware of it. So maybe <clears throat> I want to change something that we, you both discussed, uh, Tamika and, and Mark was the, the tree of, uh, of why to get to a, an idea of a root cause to, to the issue. Right. Uh, because sometimes it's not it's not working that way, right? You you could go you could do the the tree of wise, uh, go to a point where it's uh, you know it's a uh, it's a point of convergence to something, and you're still wrong about that thing, like it's it's still not <clears throat> it's still not the the real problem, and and that because sometimes um, there are intricate problems, uh, as it's not by going to a specific root cause that you solve the issue at hand because it's you know it's multi-layered. Uh, a, a good example is uh, like we we are working on on different journey customer journeys right now, and one of the thing that happens a lot in in my organization is <clears throat> they they want to like they. They come from analysis to conclusion, and they want to jump in right to solving the issue. Uh, a bit as you as you mentioned, Tamika is is the missing something in between, right? Um, and one of the things that is missing to me is not that we are not able to, you know, to ask the whys and find the root cause of any of those issues, is our inability to think beyond that. Right to think like adjacent to what we just uh, understood to like bring up like imagination in the in the in the cycle of thinking about the problem right and see how we could what we could do absolutely differently that would would cost less than fixing the root cause uh, and and potentially you know dissolve the the entire problem at at, uh, at hand. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if I, I'm totally clear here, but um... there, there's a, a great artist, cartoonist, poet from the Northeast in the States. I think he's from Vermont or something like that. His name's Brian Andreessen. And uh, he does these little vignettes and little sketches about his life. And they're little books that he's kind of like put together. Um, they're really sweet in a lot of cases. And one of the best ones is uh, this one about he's going to pick up his kid from soccer practice. European like football practice, and um, and he says, uh, he says, so how did the practice go today? And the kid says, good. We worked on fundamentals. And he says, like, why you were even kicking the ball around in the first place? And he goes, 
and from the look my child gave me, I understood that that was too fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always kind of that, that little that little vignette has always kind of like stayed to me, stayed with me when I think about stuff like that. Like if you kind of galaxy brain some of these questions, you end up like at that point, and it's yeah. like super interesting. But um, and people will give you the look, like. <laughs> so, um, did, did I? I it was too fundamental. <laughs> no, no, well, well, I, I, the, my question then becomes: in a complex scenario, do you have the right to bracket what you're doing in practice? Right, like mm. when things are complex and you know that you could that these tendrils could kind of go on forever because it's a system within a system that's adjacent to another system that's intersects with another system. And you end up with this kind of complex system. Like, can you just say for the purposes of the scope of what we're doing right now, it ends here so that we can, yeah. so that we can move, move forward. Right. Like, like, are we allowed to deal with a local maximum essentially? Yeah. I think part of that problem framing itself it's actually preserving some of that thinking that led you to have that kind of problem in the first place you cannot just dismiss and reframe a problem mm -hmm. it's something that comes naturally and i think addressing problems systemically means acknowledging the limits of your solutions as well i don't yeah. think we have a, a cure for everything uh, and seeing so many nuances sometimes yeah it's freezing the action so rather than going full skeptical like we need to suspend judgment and just take action and we have some risk each decision comes with the risk of it might not be the best solution it might not have the impact we want but we're doing it anyway to see what's going to happen well and i think that's where learning becomes so important and why i've been interested for a while in connecting design thinking with evaluative thinking right like how do we um and actually, you know, one way that I look at it, um, when it comes to evaluation, I like the idea of different types of evaluations for different um, phases or types of questions, right? And so, you know, I kind of think, it, think of design thinking as a way that you can decide um, what to implement, right? Based on an understanding um, of a problem where based on what we're talking about, we're saying you're really just taking a guess. Right, you've done some work, you've, you've framed the problem to come up with a reasonable hypothesis or challenge statement. You know, you, you've done some initial testing, you think this is going to address the problem, but then we do still need that way to learn from what we implemented, learn from what we built, and bring it back. Um, and so, even, you know, in the problem solving model that talks about framing exploration and um, decision. You know, I think what's what's missing from that is learning and then the reframing, right? Because once you do that that um, evaluation to see, you know, what happened after you attempted to solve this problem, it may give you some ideas about, well, actually, you know, we're still seeing, we're still observing that problem. It feels like it might be more this, right? Like, let's ideate on what we can do now. Yeah. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> yeah, actually, it connects well to <laughs> what I had in in mind because, you know, we. I mean, I see I see that in in my current organization, like the situation is that we already did change some changes, like uh, one year ago, uh, we saw changes in the customer journey, and it increases everything we didn't want to see. <laughs> basically it increases all the, the, the issues uh, and um, and now like we are, everyone is looking at, you know at what we did all the, the results the new results and people are just like we just don't understand what is happening right um, and and to me one of the problem is that we we jump from conclusion to solution Right, it, it has something in the middle that that is missing to me. That is not allowing for something like different to to emerge. Because if we continue like that, we we just continue what we did l last year, and we'll continue this year. 
and the next year it will be the same, right? So you, you, you could say there's two strategies to that is when we, we keep on what we are doing because we don't know if it's the effect of what we did or if it's something external to that, coming back to evaluation uh, is putting some good criteria to to understand uh, to understand that. And today, maybe we are missing some of the, of those criteria, and it's just a, a matter of the measurement in a sense, right? Um, so it makes no sense to change what we we are doing because if we do that, it it might have some other repercussions that we we cannot see right now, right? Uh, or the other approach is to say, okay, let's continue, like let's change at all everything that we are doing because it's obviously it's not bringing the results we want to see. Uh, and the last one is some, somewhere in the middle. Like, let's continue mainly what we are doing, but let's try new things in parallel to see how does that could you know lead to new opportunities. Um, but that requires for this specific type of organization to to be able to 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 escape their their current uh, frame of 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 view, and it's 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 really hard when you you are in the day to day like you know in the run every day in the run right, so um, yeah I, I see like to be your point Mark could you afford that uh, you know uh, and I agree like it's sometimes you you just cannot right so. <laughs> Do you, can you identify, like, if that was to happen in a, in a project that we were doing, there'd be a couple of different places that we would go and ask questions. And the first would be, are our observations incorrect? Right? Like, is the fundamental data that we are looking at, qualitative, quantitative, whatever, like, not, does it not make, did we miss something in terms yep. of that? Um, and then the next one is, okay, well, if the, if the data is correct and accurate, is the insights that we derive the insights that we derive of it incorrect? Is our synthesis of that like incorrect? So, which is a thesis-based problem, right? Like, yeah. generally we work on a thesis and then we kind of get wrong. But also, we very rarely do anything like that without doing something in parallel, like comparatively speaking, right? That, that if you have, I mean, yeah, the dumb version of that is like an A/B test or something like mm -hmm. that, right? But, you know, and, and there's other ones, too, where, I mean, we're going to have a lot of interesting conversations over the next year, year and a half about people's numbers dropping and pointing to, like, a larger systemic issue, like people have less disposable income, right? People are, all the streaming services are losing, you know, losing market. There's going to be some kind of consolidation coming up because not all of them can survive. Yeah. And everybody is, is being more tight with their discretionary spending, which means like, I'm going to drop Netflix or HBO or, you know, whatever it is that I'm going to do. Right. And so, yeah. so I think that it, it's, it's, those are some of those external, right. Potentially, like, I don't know specifically what it is that you're doing, but if there are market externals that are global, but you're looking at everything locally, things are going to look bad. Totally agree. You know? Yeah, of course. I, I simplify a lot of things. I don't, I cannot yes. really go into more details, but it, it the discussion reminds me of that, and I, I do feel like in in when you have limited means to at your disposal, you you need to be not necessarily smart, but at least bring up some imagination on how you could use them effectively. Because currently, I'm limited in the way I could I can understand the world of the like the the context of the the problem and the way I can affect it, right? So that's part of the issue. But I, 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 I so you know, if I you wanna, cannot, I work on the internal, you, 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 you try to work on, on the internal, in, in fact. Yeah, sorry, yeah. good. I think that that word is a really, really interesting word in the current context, imagination, right? Yeah. Like I, I th I've seen it over the last, like, you know, sometimes things pop up like over the course of like 10 days or a week and they kind of come back at you. And imagination is the word that has been like popping up all over the place for me. Um, and I think it's really fascinating. I think it's like and it's come from all kinds of things like um, in back to back conversations with people around just politics. The imagination came up in the first conversation in like it's a real failure of people being able to imagine something better. Right. 
And then in the next conversation, someone's like, you know, I think people have a really tough time imagining how much worse it could get. <laughs> you know, back to back, right? And then, and then, you know, it's been in and around just things around design that I've been reading over the last couple of weeks. I think it's funny how these like concepts kind of like pop up and then kind of disappear. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and now you've brought it up again today, the word imagination. I just think it's a, it's a <laughs> But I think it's funny how, you know, design actually is so good at creating these futures where things can go wrong. But then when it's moving towards the positive, it's actually so, so much harder to sustain. Yeah. Just a quick note to, to brag about something. Actually, uh, at the beginning of the year, I took part in this contest for Gen Zs to like tell, talk about the new commons, what happens now, what is the future about. So actually, I got to be one of the finalists. So they published a book with all our essays. I'll be happy to share it <laughs> if you're curious to see what young people think about the future. But, uh, you know, just to, to come to this. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So just to come to this uh, this idea of actually it's it's people's fear to move too further away from their present moment so what i noticed when i was working with clients is that they're not so awfully off the mark you know they're where they have to be but just just a bit misaligned to it so mm. sometimes it's either uh they're they have the wrong goal they're expecting different results but they at least have the problem sorted out more or less or they're looking at the wrong problem and they actually have the right intentions and the right goal. So sometimes it just takes a bit of recalibrating and knowing how to, how to integrate that conversation, uh, which is, uh, it's always interesting because we're not, I don't think we're dealing always with completely clueless people. And there's a little bit of imagination that needs to be stimulated in everyone. And I, uh, I agree, actually, I heard this imagination, especially in the politics spectrum, not having creative imagination really downplays on what can be done towards the future because mm -hmm. we can't do what we've always done. We're not at least learning from that. Yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I was reading recently. I don't know who shared that with me. Like I, I came to, I think it was a Twitter feed. I don't remember. Someone coming back to um, how, how um, uh, explore, like, you know, Future, future, futurism and and design, uh, visionary design stuff like that, uh, came became more dark and negative uh, in the the past. I don't know if Matt, it it was you. I, I sent it to yeah. you. It was yeah. uh, Peter Thiel Stanford lecture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was really interesting, and he came back to to history of how do we came with this kind of negativity bias in imagining the future. And I, I do feel like it's interesting, um, and that's true that it's easier to it's easier to imagine what could go wrong about our current life, right? Uh, in a sense, because yeah, it's because, easier to criticize than create. Let's put it this way. <laughs> yeah, but it's easier to to be negative in general. Like we, we have. Um, we have a tendency. Because you have a point of reference, you yes. know, with the creation, it's hard to make that departure. It's also it's also the way things are trending, like science fiction, and there, it's always an extrapolation, and things are trending badly, <laughs> right? Gener yeah. Generally speaking, right? Like there are some things that are that are trending kind of in an okay direction, um, <laughs> and maybe over the last couple of weeks, the trend has been less bad, mm -hmm. um, but. But on the whole, things are, for many, many people, things are trending badly. So if you extrapolate from that, I think it's fair that people are pessimistic, right? I, I think people are also manipulated into that pessimism by the media. Yeah. yeah and you know, and negative, I, negative emotions tend to be stronger in general. So, yeah. so it's, easier to, it's easier to manipulate and it's easier to, to perceive things with, you know, using them because they... Like they, yeah, they, they I mean, have stronger impacts on us. What what is it? Fake and inflammatory things spread seven times faster on Twitter. Yeah. Than you know, bad news than good news, right? So, <laughs> you know, and that's you know by design, right? Yes, so, and it's it's part of the human 
you know, uh, it's one of the human features as well. So, <laughs> so. Well, but I it was I'll... good in nature when you had to adapt because nothing was supposed to kill you <laughs> if you're not paying attention. But now, Wait, not isn't I mean nature, like naturally things feel more matter of fact than they do hyperbolized, right? Like, you mm. know the when the lions like, you know snack on a gazelle it, it's it's a matter of fact it's not a conspiracy against gazelles <laughs> you know? like, i would love whereas, to read that theory <laughs> you know, well, well the thing of, i mean like like if it was like the gazelle the gazelle daily or something like that they would you know they would have their point of view on it and the gazelle daily would say you know uh Lions yeah, but... overly aggressive, you know, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, right? They manufacture some kind of like conspiracy against. And then there'll be some diversity and inclusion page where lions date gazelles. <laughs> That's yeah, That's I see. And then, I see and then, the. And then the older, slower gazelles, they would be like that. Would just be like the lions are just ageist, you know, going after the. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I agree. But now, you know, like the, the ongoing, because I'm studying the, the metaverse. And actually, I have a call in five minutes. So I'll have to jump on this one, talk about the metaverse. Uh, and how do we make sure it's not dystopian? It's not fully grounded in the virtual world. And it actually has a purpose and it solves problems. Because I think it has been really difficult so, to make others understand that it has a, it can have a creative purpose but it's not the one that's now happening it's in the toddler phase you know you, you can't possibly tell me so it's, it's, putting still... everything, it's putting everything in its mouth yeah exactly <laughs> and just stumbling and not making much sense so will you, will you be reporting back to us on the outcomes of the uh, i will try part? i'm trying to kind of pitch in a different idea of the enterprise metaverse which is more on this you know and business level focus and how to actually help co-creation engagement in there without emphasizing on how crazy it is to be in the metaverse, but how useful it can be. But I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Tamika was kind of talking about how, um, how, how do you learn? And the thing is you cannot in, in, in high stakes poke in, in high stakes finance stuff and, and healthcare, right? You, you, you can't purposely make mistakes and experiment because that uh, leads to death and that leads to financial loss. And so how do you learn in those situations? You can't. And so that's why you kind of need some kind of safe space to, to learn and have a playground to learn. And so, you know, in, in my opinion, like, you know, the, the metaverse has, has two things to offer, a simulation and a voodoo doll. So if you, if you, if you, if you hurt the voodoo doll, it hurts you too. You know, in the real world. That's very specific in the industrial metaverse cases, the voodoo doll kind of, because you're kind of interacting with a digital tween if you're repairing something. And the other one, actually, it's uh, being used with the digital humans, for, like mm -hmm. testing, whatever, uh, I don't know, medical yeah. things. But it's still, you know, uh, you need to really be good at creating these systems and understand problems, frame problems effectively in a, a simulated environment. It's no longer the real one. You have to think within different parameters. And I think this adds a very strange layer of complexity. But uh, please do go and discuss. Uh, <laughs> I will listen to the recording, the rest of the recording. And uh, yes, I, uh, I will report back next time. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was nice to, to, to see you. See you all. And I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Yeah. So she was talking about the not metaverse metaverse, basically, because the metaverse is, you know, the, the one from Facebook meta, right? So it's, it's, it's not like this one, what she was discussing. No, no, I, I understand. <laughs> She's talking about the, the big M or whatever, the, it's not, 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 the writ not large leg, one. Leg, legs are hard metaverse. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not yeah. not the branded Coca Cola, but just Coke. The Coke. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because like I, I worked on an exercise about um it was for actually it was for 
uh, a job interview and I did an, uh, a design exercise on uh, digital identities. And oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and one of the principles I, I included right right away is uh, because like I had limited time, so you know primary research was really like not possible at all. Uh, so I did a bunch of, you know, secondary research and, <clears throat> and of course, like thinking about, you know, the principles that, that would accompany any, any of my reasoning. And one of them was like ground the virtual in the physical, like find a way to connect the two. So anything that happens in the virtual has some of the natural um useful uh, frictions that you have in the physical um and, and i find it interesting to to try to find ways to to you know to bring some of the frictions in the virtual because if if it's purely virtual then there's no real limits right and one of the issue with that is high volatility because there's no limits, like everything goes, can go like exponentially uh, in increasing, right? You, you, could, you could never reach the point of the, of, of the limit because there's absolutely none. And I don't like the, the reasoning that you can see in some places where, you know, you can buy um, squares of lens, of virtual lens. I don't know which one, which metaverse it is, uh, but you can buy uh, lens, virtual lens, and it, it you know, you, and it's pixel size, right? So you, you can buy uh, some pixels. Uh, and and to, to make a price about that purchase, you need to have a limit. Because if, if, the, if the world, the virtual world is limitless, as it's supposed to be, right? Then there's no point to buy anything, right? Because, because where, like, there's no real demand and offer issue oh, right? no, no scarcity you mean yeah and so they introduced a fake a fake scarcity principle like they, they said our land is that big so if you want to buy uh, one pixel it will it will cost that much and and the less pixel there, there is the the higher the price is like as it works in in the real world right uh, and you'd say well this is an example where you bring some of the physical uh, you know uh, properties of buying lands in the in the virtual but here you yeah. see that it's it doesn't work not really because it's so artificial right it's like who decided it was you know i don't know uh 4000 pixel uh, size and and that it was divided and that many pixels and you know it it, it was purposely done right it's not like you have the land you have and you you have to split it in, in some in some places like it, it's not the same type of uh constraints right I, I feel like it's it because it's purposeful it's dishonest in, in a way right it's it's meant to be that way for for someone to extract the most money out of it and nothing else yeah. right so well there's, there's two i mean two things to consider there one is does adjacency matter Right, like the the typical kind of real estate thing, location, location, location. Right. So, does in this virtual world does adjacency matter in any kind of way? Right. I I don't know enough about it. <clears throat> so it may not be like the size, but it might be the location that drives the value of the pixel. And then the other one is the algorithmically uh, provable scarcity, like Bitcoin. Right. Which you kind of have the same. It's a monetary version of the same thing, where it's it's you know, built in a way that you, that there is algorithmical and kind of non or like permanent scarcity built into it, right? Because it's foundational and the whole thing will fall apart. Like, I, I, I don't know the math on it. I just know in theory that that's what, how that's supposed to work. So, it, so it, it is, digital scarcity is at least in concept possible, right? I don't know how robust it is. I don't know how, um, you know, like, <laughs> can it be hacked? That's math that's beyond my, mm. you know, level. 
but in theory, anyway, those are those are two things to consider well, in that space. Th and there's, I'm a not physical, there's a physical physical hack to to the issue of Bitcoin, for instance. You put more ener energy in the system. Like if you have more computers that do the work, you have more chance to, you know, to increase the the amount of Bitcoin you can you can mine, and therefore you have more chance to get money out of it, right? So it's it, exactly what you see, like the tendency of, you know, these big farms of servers that's just mining endlessly uh, cryptocurrencies and that burns uh, like a small country size uh, uh, amount of fuel uh, to, to run that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, all over Europe, people are taking their rigs offline because the price of Bitcoin being down, the rewards being down and the price of energy being up doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. Right. So, Which I find really. Talk about adding friction, like the real world has invaded that the virtual right in a really inter in a really interesting way. And I'm not like, I mean, again, I'm Bitcoin agnostic. <laughs> I don't like the fact, I, don't, I don't like the fact that they're burning forests to make it to make it run, um, and I have no opinion on like whether it's going to zero or to the moon. Like other people who are speculating on that, but from a just a theoretical point of view, I think it's an interesting. Yeah, it's in, it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens to it because it's proven not to be a hedge, for example, which is what people thought it might be, right? Um, so I find it interesting that it's not. Mm -hmm. just, just going back to the um, uh, virtual currency, um, but but like in virtual environment, um, uh, you have you heard about Eve Online? Um, it's a massive uh, multiplayer yes. uh, game that's been around for almost twenty or thirty years, right? Mm -hmm. And. Um, and for them, you know, they have a massively inflating economy, but, you know, in a, in a very interesting way, the inflation doesn't actually hit the market because they have a very expensive market, by the way. So it hasn't really uh, affected the market because the production, the local production mechanism of, of people building the ships to supply is actually meeting the demand. So this is actually one of the key things that actually reflects very closely to the real economy too. our economy is that money, money supply, even if you increase it tenfold, um, may not actually even cause inflation. It's actually the vibes that cause inflation. You know, there's there's a vibe aspect, which is that um, your expectation is either matched or subverted or, you know, something happens to your expectation that actually causes the phenomenon of inflation, which is actually very neat because, you know, you think about it, you know, t television, right? Um, because because of the massive competition and the, the, the technological innovation of the viewing screen, you get massive deflation because over the last, you know, uh, you know, 30 years or so, the same TV is now 40% cheap, cheaper, right? But when you look at education, higher education and healthcare, these things have gone through the roof, like 20 fold, you know, 14 fold. So, um, so, you know, various different industries have different vibes. And, and every once in a while, you just need a vibe check when you when you see that, okay, the U.S. GDP um, is 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 four times that of China, but the healthcare spending is actually like, you know, or uh, uh, G GDP per capita. Sorry, but did you know that like like the U.S. healthcare spending per capita is actually more than the per capita of Ch China per capita GDP? Like we're spending more on healthcare than than what an average Chinese person makes, right? Um, so that's, per person. yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just saying per person. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And, and I think, I think, you know, society just needs a vibe check on those. Once you get the vibe check, then you actually get a change. So, um, so going back to Eve again, um, they, they, they could have kept on going, but then for some reason, you know the, the developers they, they 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 had a vibe check right so they raised the 
so so normally when you do a transaction, the in the real world, the um, the the tax for the transaction is like 0.2 percent, right? You know, like if you trade stocks or whatever, it's very very little. But in Eve, it's like two percent. And uh, they they had a vibe check because they want to like dial back some of the liquidity in the economy, so they raised that transaction tax from two to five. Well, that triggered a really really huge reaction because that caused the vibe ripple effect throughout the economy, and then they started building their own markets um, adjacent to the official markets of Eve. And so then they were running their own black markets, and so to speak, to to avoid this. So you mm -hmm. so you actually get to see some spillovers due to a vibe check that caused vibe checks that caused real um, subversion. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit like you're, I mean, if I understand correctly, it's kind of narrative economics is how they refer to that. Is that the same thing? Narrative economics? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I thought. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, <clears throat> even now, like, <clears throat> the gas prices were really interesting, right? So gas prices were through the roof, but even when the cost per barrel came down, the prices stayed up, and it was just like a whole lot of profiteering. But it was done under the cover of inflation. So inflation gave the narrative kind of possibility for like a lot of skimming off the top and keeping profits high, right? But, and, that, and that wouldn't have been possible without that narrative of inflation, yeah. right? Yeah, Pep Pepsi did this too, right? like, you know, record profit margins, like, where did that come from? Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely took advantage of the vibe, definitely took advantage of the narrative. Uh, you know, if you have local supply chains, but, you know, the rest of the world is affected by China supply constraints and Russian you know, <laughs> natural resource constraints, then you can get away with things like that. For sure. I can, I can tell you that's... Uh... I have two good examples. One is uh, dating back the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, I worked in the banks. Uh, I was in working in the bank at the time, and they were doing record-breaking uh, profits uh, during these periods. So, like you know, every every everyone was at home. Stores were were locked um, and closed. Uh, people were not in the streets. So. Like, you know, from a, a, an economical uh, standpoint, how do you create uh, value? How do you, you know, create uh, uh, transactions where, where people are just stuck at home and not buying that much compared to, to usual and, and stuff like that? So you say, okay, economically, it's, it's like, it, it means that everyone will lose money, right, on the market because of that, because everything was, will will uh, decrease, right? And, and price will go up and stuff like that. But none of this happens, uh, happened actually, right? Uh, and, and this is because in reality, and this is where I would say uh, countries and politics are not that good at, uh, you know, conveying this aspect of, of economics is that uh, economics, econo like financial markets has been decoupled that much of, actual fluctuations of you know transactions within a, a, um, a local market markets uh, or local um, a geographical uh, a landscape that that they, they are not that much impacted by by that kind of you know uh, aspect of it uh, which is which is interesting uh, which tells a lot of how banks actually make money <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah that that is interesting and it's it's rarely discussed right in in like in the public uh, circles, like if you if you ask people how banks make money, it's like because I, I put money there and they, they just make profit out of it. Uh, it it's, it's not that at all, right? And it, the same way, I'm working now in the insurance, uh, health insurance, and you know um, uh, the price of insurance will has increased uh, now. We we are arriving at the end of this year, so every everything uh, has uh, has been announced that everything would be would cost much and uh, much more and, and stuff like that uh, but it's not because things cost more today it's because because they are doing risk-based assessments on how people should how much people should pay they estimated that uh, given the risks coming in the next years uh, three to five years they have to increase that much 
the price to compensate for the potential loss, right? So things increase now for something that will happen in the future, which has impacts on other things, right? And how people spend money on things and how people prioritize where they spend money on things uh, and other uh, market signals that this kind of decisions makes. Like if that increase, that means other things will increase. So people are paying more of that now. So, and stuff like that, you know, and all these repercussions now have the kind of economic, economical effects that we see, at least in the Swiss markets of everything going up, like everything going, going up, not because things are actually going up, you know, but because some anticipate that the, the fact that things will go up, right? It's where checking the vibes, as you mentioned, yeah, um, the vibe, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, makes, makes sense. Um, and to come back to the virtual lens, um, actually people were buying lens, uh, you know, to make their logo and stuff like that, because it was mostly brain brand, brands, sorry, that wanted to, to buy lens in this virtual, um, uh, lens. Uh, and, uh, the reason is that it, it was just for, you know, saying where well, we have land in the metaverse and, and that was like just a, a gimmick, but <clears throat> But how do you, you know, how do you bring that, that kind of dynamics and, you know, vibes in a, a virtual world that respond as a, not necessarily as a physical world, but where you actually bring some of the friction in the individual, I, I do find it is an interesting challenge. And it goes to one of the thing I was discussing in the Slack channels is, um, are we even supposed to make that happen? Right. It, maybe it's uh, it's like in architecture, it's paper arch architecture, you know, things that were not meant to be built, uh, but just exist on, on paper to, to foster an imagination. Um, uh, uh, they are crazy. They are most of the time they are, you know, gigantic and uh, over the top. Uh, and I don't know. I don't see parallels directly in the digital, but I, 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 maybe maybe all these decentralized um, models uh, that we see now should be maybe not built, but should exist as you know means to explore new new ways of doing the digital world. I don't know. Um, like the, this virtual land is uh, meaningless, right? Uh, people were just buying that for 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 being visible basically um, <clears throat> so maybe it should not, not have been built <laughs> in the first place right uh, but if it was uh, if it were a, a, a crazy idea and a crazy in a, in a good sense uh, what kind of um, coming back to imagination what kind of imagine imagination and what kind of new ideas would that foster right uh, I find it interesting so uh, real quick, I think like one of the crucial recipes of world peace is uh, growth, but that comes into conflict with sustainability because you, if you have forever prosperous economic growth, you have to pay with real natural resources. So, um, so then we have to revisit okay, what is the minimum growth that we can obtain uh, and still kind of keep equilibrium? And so, because, because when you don't have growth, all of a sudden you are competing with fixed resources. And this is, you know, psychologically, we can't say that, that with the Fed, Federal Reserve lower, increasing the interest rate led to, um, you know, Putin invading Ukraine. We can't really say that, but we can say that from a vibe standpoint that that is somewhat true, right? The expectation that easy money is not going to be there forever after COVID, you know, after once COVID recedes, um, it's back to um, competitive mode again. And so, um, and so that's that's kind of the paradox, really, is. Um, uh, how to manufacture the idea of growth without having um, this kind of competition. In public economics, there's two by two matrix, 
which you can distinguish between a club good, a public good, a private good. And, you know, it's, it's based upon rivalry. Rivalry being, you know, when you're in a park and a park is full, um, it's a rival good, right? It's, if it's a non-rival good, if it's digital. So, you know, if, if you had like, you know, a digital land, right? That's non-rival. You can enjoy the land without it feeling crowded, so to speak, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so the idea is how to um, maximize this sense in people's uh, mind share, so to speak, right? How to maximize the most amount of utility uh, within a person's mind and how to shape that utility uh, curve. Um, I think also, you know, one of the things that we can look at is kind of FTX and effective altruism. You know, Sam, Sam Bankman-Fried, um, you know, he, it was fraud, but in some sense, he thought he was also doing the right thing. Uh, when you really try to look deep down in his convictions and his, you know, root cause analysis and effective altruism, he he did donate quite a bit to uh, causes, right? Um, and uh, and and I think it's it's one of those things where he created or he adopted, you know, a uh, uh, philosophical, um, ethical vibe, and and use that utility function to carry out. You know, it's a, a, a crypto exchange protocol, um, which which ultimately didn't work. It, it tried to, it, it made a bad trade and it tried to replicate the fractional reserve of the actual market, which you, without it being backed by a government, it doesn't work. But, um, but yeah, that's all I had to add for there. <laughs> We, we don't if hear you, Kamika. Can... Sorry. You, you are yeah, speaking, but we don't hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Still no? You now can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now it's good. Oh, sorry. I For some reason, I've been having connection issues, so that's why my camera was going out now and then. But I, but I did want to say I, I do have to um, drop. But um, I'm glad I got to participate this mm -hmm. time and looking forward to the next time. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye. I think it's one of the things that's kind of interesting is that you, as a designer, you, you feel like the things that you're going to do are going to have an effect in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the definition of what world is now is changing <laughs> right? or has changed and starting to develop right and so i think that there's some there are some interesting questions in terms of like effect right and i do i i think like design fiction is kind of an interesting the marriage between kind of the metaverse and design fiction and even like the idea of digital twins or something like that is kind of like is it a place to experiment Right. Is, and, and are the are the effects the same there? Like, can it be a reliable place to experiment? I think is an interesting question. Right. Like, can, like is the you could like insert like mechanically digital twins can work really interesting in a really interesting way because they're like complicated systems that you can create. Right. And they are, and but complexity you don't need a lot of difference for it not to react the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's right. So, so I, I can see that like the notion of digital twins is really fascinating for, for complicated things, engines yeah. and turbines and things like that. Right. Where you can go in and, and you know, there's a predictable way that something, if I, if I move, I change this valve, there's a predictable way that the rest of the system will work because it's comp it's complicated, but it's not necessarily complex. Right, it's kind of what I'm thinking. So, so is it reliable? Is there a reliable way to um, do a, a digital twin in a complex environment? Mm. Well, it's. Um, I think one of the issues is uh, using multi-parameters um, of, of different models to try to augment one another 
and and still try to create a reliable result. Like before this whole Web three um, digital twin and 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 simulation stuff was going on, there there was computational fluid dynamic uh, simulation models that were out there. the The problem was that they were not accurate enough to be you know considered industrial scale use you know for for production. Um, they they're they're definitely used for you know um, the initial design process to kind of like give you the right shapes and then after you make the mistakes and you build it you 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 tailor back and then you make compromises later on right but but I think now with you know now that you have machine learning and and these more advanced stuff that that um, don't use empirical principles of CFD, you know, Navier-Stokes equation, but actually just like do the actual um, real life simulations, you know, QA testing almost um, uh, at a very, very cheap computational speed and, and, and whatnot. That's, that kind of blows, uh, blows the possibilities of, of, of what can now be achieved uh, at, at a very low cost now. So yeah. basically, it's it's everybody's playground to just do something and make something. The, the question is, whose toes are you going to step on? Because you know this is a playground of incumbents at the moment, and and you know if you if you do anything, people are watching, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the most fascinating places where I see this working and also see the limitations right now is Formula One, right? All of these cars, the new cars that came out for this year were all modeled, right? Um, And then they had this like insane porpoising issue in a lot of cases, which wasn't able to be simulated like prior to because it needed the weight of the driver. It needed the buffeting. It needed the roughness of the track. It needed all that kind of stuff to happen. And so I think, I mean, they got these people with this kind of like box of parameters all went away and came back with different tri- drive trains. And if you think about it, I mean, they're within like a half a second of each other around a two and a half kilometer track, right? Like the, the differences are really kind of minimal. But even then, it has taken the real world like placement of these virtually created things to optimize them. Like they weren't they yeah. were optimizable without the real world, right? Yeah, So so, you know, one of the, one of the big things that artificial intelligence does really well is that the world is not monotonic increase. Mm-hmm. It's actually very cyclical. Like every single movement, every single inch, every single micrometer of, of movement, it also goes like two steps forward, one step back. That's reality. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and being able to control dynamically that um, is, is not within the realm of human capabilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you, so you actually have to take that aspect out of human control, right? You can only give human control the ability to turn left and right, but all the other micro stuff needs to be controlled in, in a different way. And, and you know, that's, that's actually just kind of the beauty of engineering is your feature engineering performance gains, not based upon percentages anymore, but to discover effects that haven't been that are considered idiosyncratic, right? Like things like Magnus effects and stuff like that, right? Or, or, you know, Tacoma Narrow Bridge, right? It it failed not because it couldn't handle load, but it because it didn't it wasn't designed with uh with resonance frequencies in mind. So, you know, the entire bridge was built off of the same material um, so there was no heterogeneity. And so a gentle 12 mile per hour wind, you know, rocked well, it to where it well, just fell. 10 people walking in, you know, in rhythm on the, on the bridge were sufficient to make it, you know, increase like over time with the add of the, the same movement, like, yeah. And, the, and, 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 and that's another thing weird. That's a weird thing too, about humans is that. Um, when you walk in groups, you always end up going left, right, and synchronize with each other. Even if you like, yeah. don't even know the people. You know, it's just like a very stranger, well, you know, that works, tribal. That aspect. works when you have like a, a, a like when you have a, a feedback from the others' uh, rhythm. 
right? That's the, the case with the bridge. Like as people are working on, on it, it creates like it creates a rhythm and everyone's frequency adjusts to like create a pattern where of coherence where everything meets at a point where it's the same frequency for everyone, right? So uh, it works only when you have this feedback. Like the bridge itself is uh, a participant of uh, everyone else um, synchronicity, right? Which is not always true when you work like in the the streets. Like you might be in in synchronicity with maybe two or three people, but when you have 200 people, it's, 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 you know, in the middle of the mass, You, you don't really see it, right? Yes, stadium seating is like that, right? Yes. Because people will cheer, like, and stomp and cheer in unison, exactly. right? All of the same time. Yeah, so, yeah. That's yeah, and, and you have, like, all the experiential effects of it. Like, you hear the the, 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 the noise, like, people like doing the, the hola, you know, uh, the <laughs> wave. And, and then you see it coming, and you, 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 you do it because you see everyone else doing it, but you have the noise, you have the... You know the 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 sights. You have the the vibration on the on the floor and stuff like that. So, so it participates to to this feedback, right? Now I, I'm I'm we were discussing a bit virtual world and um and something I personally find as a, a major issue to like virtual worlds and and digital stuff in general is that it's really you know, intentional as a medium, like you, people need to need to develop them for for them to work, right? It's always designed, everything about it is designed with an intention to perform some kind of action for, you know, another goal, right? Um, uh, And it's really different from the real world for, for that aspect, right? Because you might say yes, it's designed, but it's not the same. Like it's, it's not designed for for a, a common general purpose, right? Okay, the the trees, the the ground, and uh, the, the the organisms living in in the you know in this ecosystem, they are responding to each other. But uh... but that's why humans have ideology. You know, that's why <laughs> that's why humans, you know, because humans have their innate you know um uh they have their modal um uh subjectivity but they also require a lens that is somewhat designed right like you know you have to build you have to uh adopt an ideology you have to adopt you know a religious belief or adopt nihilism or something right and and that that ideology was designed um, it, it may, it's not, maybe the real world isn't, but, um, the ideology yeah. lenses. Yeah, I agree with you. What, what, where I'm getting at with that is, is, um, you, you were talking about heter- heterogeneity of, of the medium of the bridge, for instance. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that makes, uh, physical materials, uh, stronger is, is, is not to be a necessity, um, heterogeneous right the, you uh homogeneous sorry you 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 want diversity in it and and one of the thing that digital worlds lacks the most is diversity right you you tend to over time because they are goal oriented and and designed in that way uh, you tend to reduce options because it's the it's the most efficient way to do it right but n- nature don't don't care that much about uh, our way of perceiving efficiency, right? It, it's not doing it the same way. Um, and, um, uh, you know, um, I, I shared a video about the third place and this idea that uh, uh, for a community to work, you need uh, you need two ta- uh, three types of places. Uh, it's one of the, the way you live, the, the, the place you live, the place you work, and the third place, which is none of these, right? Which is something else that uh, you need for for social interactions uh for making new connections discovering new ideas new people um you know mixing up uh classes and uh people with different backgrounds and stuff like that and 
and, and that, that means it's it's uh, in a way it's it's diversity. It's an expression of diversity, right? Which is not the living place. The the place where you live is necessarily not that way, right? It's designed for for you. It's it's your place, right? So that way it's 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 not diverse. It's 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 you. It's yours, right? And and the, the workplace is is the same. It's designed for something, like, and you just here to help achieve that thing, right? So, uh, I do feel like in in any way we, I, I cannot really frame it perfectly, but this is missing, right? This is missing, especially if we discuss about metaverse and and stuff like that. Um, um, like, there's some kind of um, uh, randomness and uh, informality. And you know unexpected things that happens in uh, a, di a diverse place that that cannot be designed, right? That cannot really be designed. It can be constrained, but it cannot be uh, explicitly designed. So I, I wouldn't say that the third place is missing because some people hold on to ideologies much strongly than you are, you do. Like <laughs> the American consumer ideology they go to starbucks and starbucks is their third place um you know and and others who hold you know political ideologies they they do you know these these meetups uh to, to talk about you know how to get you know this candidate elected and whatnot you know there's uh, i would say it really depends on the the, the the degree of of how how much you want to be in a cult and that's that's one of the interesting things too uh, that maybe we can even talk about is how everything now is a cult. You know, everything is all about joining my, joining this Discord and pump this NFT or pump <laughs> this you know crypto coin or whatever. It's it's all a cult. And and so how do you harness positive effects of uh, of of cult like behavior, right? Because maybe ideologies are all that we really have at the end of the day but we don't want empty mm. ones that leave us extinct but so, ones that leave us in a better place uh after we're we're done with it when we mature true. out of it if you if you want to tend to, like a really good definition of a cult is loyalty beyond reason mm. i think like I, I really like that 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 definition i think we're in trouble if we leave reason behind completely right <laughs> but there's a trick there's a trick i i feel like yeah. there's a there's something interesting so uh, i was reading like some time ago about assemblage theory uh from Deleuze and and guattari yeah, yeah, yeah. uh and i really love the concept of uh terri territory territorialization and deterioration i i cannot pronounce it well sorry my yeah, french easy is... for you to say yeah, it's not easy for me to say. <laughs> That's easy to say. Yeah, and then the concept is um, that for for uh, like for a community to 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 work, you need to create a territory for it, right? So yeah. you need to territorialize the yeah. the community, so it will create boundaries um, yeah. with the, the the rest, which is not the community, right? Uh, and as soon as you bring up too much diversity in that community then you deteriorize it. I cannot pronounce it still, but you understood me. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, uh, because you, 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 you dissolve the borders, you, you dissolve the, the boundaries with the, the rest and it's too porous to, yeah. to hold the, the community anymore. Right. And, and that works with many things. It, it works with like the, the whole concept is that works with at different levels, with different type of, uh, of, uh, groupments that they call assemblages. Right. And, and an assemblage is, um, defined in, uh, that the, the parts, uh, uh, coupled together increases the effect of each other. So everything is, is stronger because of it. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's, in a sense, it's what achieve a cult in an extreme way, right? Um, and you could imagine that uh, for the sake of it, uh, for for it to be to be good, like in its effects, it it has to live for a certain time. It has to exist for a certain time, and then you dissolve it. 
because this is the only way to save from not being re losing the reason, right? So you could you could say one of my one of the feature of my cult is it's a temporary one. It exists for the purpose of existing at a certain point of time uh, and place because the the coupling effect of everything together will, will create something stronger. But then but then we need to dissolve it purposefully so we don't lose that reason. Like you can go back into retrospective and go back into digesting and you know bringing much more diversity in your. But I, I would I would argue that the that not all assemblages are cults and that a cult is a very specific kind of assemblage, which, which, yeah, which chucks away reason, which actually reinforces that interiority, right. In a way. And you can see that all over the place, like the discarding of reason. And the, I mean, look at Republicans in Georgia um, who are, you know, pro-life who somehow, did mental gymnastics to make Herschel Walker a suitable candidate. Like if you listen to any of those interviews, the amount of work that needs to be done, you know, to make that happen is like, that's a cult, right? Because yes. you, you can't, can't reason your way kind of out of that, or you can specifically reason your way into it. Right. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know exactly what the, like what the way is, yeah. but I mean, it's I would, like, all, all through. <laughs> exa exactly. Right. And so, but so, and I think that that cult-like behavior actually, like, resists deterritorialization, right? Like, that's that's what it's for, right? Because I think yeah. that at that that's point, true. there is this kind of, like, fundamental kind of, like, like, my being is so tied to this assemblage that the psychic damage of the assemblage coming apart could destroy me in some way right i mean that's like hyperbolic in a way but that's the way yeah. that that you know like french continental philosophers would probably talk about it right they would talk <laughs> about like the destruction of the ego and that, all that kind of thing, right so so you would kind of have that there's this um there's this real desire to keep that assemblage from deterritorialization deterritorialization because of what it would do to the individuals involved Right. You would have yeah. to like, like, you know, so I think I think it's a really I think the notion of cults and and assemblages is super interesting. Actually, I've never really kind of thought about it that way before, but I think it's a really interesting thing. And I also think the notion of I mean, bringing it back to kind of like branding and design, this idea of being aware that you are creating a temporary cult. Right. Is is actually I mean, it's. Where the ethics of that? <laughs> well, no, that, that's it's. I was gonna say it's like highly effective and problematic at the same time, right? It's not, yeah, it's good it's design. It's disingenuous to say that that's what you're trying to do, right? <laughs> like, if you're really honest with yourself, that you, when you're fabricating these stories that you want to get people involved in, you know, for better yeah. or for worse, you know. Um, and SP SPF is like a good kind of example of that, right? Like there was a real kind of story around what it was that he was doing that was more important than, oh, I don't know, governance. This, you know? this <laughs> Sunday, I, I joined um, an, an effective altruism um, uh, meetup and okay. uh, played some board games. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have to do some anthropological studies about this because this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, what do you, so what do you what do you think about that? like that effective altruism? I mean, it starts with uh, Peter Singer. Castle? Peter Singer, right? You know, the the whole it, idea it, that um, if there was a kid who was drowning uh, in a pool and you were wearing yeah. Louis Vuitton sneakers or whatever, you wouldn't care ruining your sneakers to save the kid, right? But yeah. Similarly, you you never would have to buy Louis Vuitton sneakers in the first place, and you can save kids with your four hundred dollars saved just by <laughs> yeah. donating it. And that's that's effective altruism at its core. Back in two thousand six, before but it isn't, was, it's also before kind it of ruthless too, though, isn't it? Isn't it, it is. Like, it is. Get, so there's a joke have, like... that says, "How do you kill an effective altruist? You paint a twenty dollar bill at the bottom of a pool." Because every snatch, <laughs> um, they would reason that the that the log that that, that the um, 
utility function is still linear, and so they would snatch it again and again and again. Yeah, it's also, um, it's also uh, William McCaskill, isn't it? The Scottish guy? Isn't yeah, he, and you know, he kind of like there's actually, it off a little bit? there's actually a very <clears throat> interesting um, intellectual yeah. hierarchy behind effective altruism too, because you know, Ayn Rand was really, really against altruism, right? Uh, because of because of its, you know, like. Uh, you know, ontologically, you know, corrupt, selfless nature is like very anti, you know, bi biology, very anti Aristotelian. Um, but effective altruism is go ahead and be selfish, you know, get your promotion, make as much money as you possibly can, but then be selfless, right? Basically, um, keep your keep your logarithmic <laughs> utility function, you know, by being selfish, but at the tail end, you can sculpt it by being linear again yeah. so that it's, might be it's interesting when, it's to the point where you know donating one percent of your revenue is not a cost anymore and yeah yeah so this is where i yeah. i'm saying that effective altruism is kind of like an ideological designed lens right that's mm -hmm. that's given to a modern audience and seeing if if they will chew on it and bite on it which certainly somebody has but it's just to the detriment of 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 maybe the the brand or the marketing of the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this 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 is it here. Doing good better. Got it on my. Yeah, there's something oh, that I, I don't like with with it is uh, basically this uh, this idea that if you set clearly your goals and you measure against it, and if your goals are ethically, you know, uh, like greater, basically. Uh, then it, it, it then you did something good, no matter what is really the outcome, right? There's right. something. Well, well, so I I, th I talked to them actually. I discussed this with them um, and on Sunday that you know I, I was basically saying that you guys don't really account very much for second order effects. Like they they yeah. really only yeah. look at first order effects. Like for them, mosquito nets, right? Malaria, three thousand dollars, you save a life. But then when you tell them the story that um, you give them a mosquito net and they use it for fishing and then they like grab up all the net, all the fish eggs because the mosquito nets are so fine meshed um, that you basically ruin the, the river ecosystem. Um, then they're like, wow, uh, yeah, I guess we have to think about that a little bit more. Right. So they it's just that their solutions are so one dimensional that it's it's really easy to poke holes at them but yet they still have mosquito nets like it's like it's 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 beyond questioning right it's yeah. it's like what mark yeah. says it's it's a it's a cultish uh behavior uh that they they won't listen to that argument it is kind, it of, is kind ironic of ironic because they um like the the line of thinking is supposed to be so rigorous in terms of those kinds of effects, right? And then yes. it stumbles kind of at the last. <laughs> at the last to, me, to me, they are, they are um, um, a, like a, a, a version of this uh, utili utilitarian uh, maximalist. Uh, maximalist. They're right? hyper utilitarians, right? yeah. yes, and. Um, and, you know, one of the weird things is, you know, they, they branch off into many different uh, things like AI ethics, right? And they use a very utilitarian framework uh, in, in, in analyzing it. Um, so, you know, I was trying to describe to them, you know, how Pascal's wager kind of works, right? Pascal's wager is that there's something when as soon as you deal with like religion, there's infinite EV and negative infinite EV. And as soon as you bring in infinity to to, to an equation, um, it 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 prioritizes your results. Like it catapults something absurd, and that becomes your number one priority. So AI ethics is one of those things where it's one of those apocalyptic extinction events, right? Because if you make a, a general artificial intelligence that's better than humans, then humans are you know they'll go extinct. So th so AI safety is a very high priority to them because of this negative infinity ev um and, and so it, it kind of drives that right uh, but, but, but they, they, yeah. they are really into causal relationships and that's where this is why they don't see the second order effects but because they they are looking for like they are re reductionists 
uh, and there are big proponents of, of, that, of that because that. Because, because it's easier, because it's easier to, to, to measure, to measure and, and then it's easier to say you did good, you did good. Because, because because you measure, because you measure something, that is something that is reduced reduced yeah I think you know there there uh, more um, their macro ethics right is is one where if you save a life that life could lead to thousands of generations of living people, um, you know, th hundreds and thousands of years later. And so, um, so, so therefore each individual life has this very high value um, today. And basically they, they lower their discounting um, to zero and basically build, build a very effective ethics system that mirrors uh, the, the financial system that we had 10 years ago <laughs> or for the last 10 years. Yeah. 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 So just coming back to, to, to cults and assemblage theory, uh, I have, I, I think I have an example of something that acts exactly as we just discussed. Um, and it's, it's no less than uh, TV shows like, if you create a great TV show, like you will have a cult around it. Like people just, you know, so into it that they, they, their life is about it, right? It's, it's only that. They, it's, it's so strong that they, if, even if the, like, even if a, a TV show has necessarily an end, you know, at some point. No, at some point. Um, um, I mean, that's even, why it's called even... programming, right? TV programming. There's, <laughs> there, it literally is um, about, um, you know, basically implanting a software um, uh, of ideology for how you view, the, how, how you view and, and behave and make decisions. Hmm. I, I don't know if it's, if, if it's that intentional <laughs> or, or, always, but uh, I agree. Yeah. So, so what I think I find interesting is like when, when the TV show ends, um, you, you see the, you see that the, the cult is, um, yeah. Thank you for, for joining again, Mark. Yeah, good, to, good to see you both, uh, talk soon. I just got a little emergency to do it. All right. Thanks. Thank bye. Um, um, I, I won't uh, stay uh, late, by the way, um, much more later, um, Matt, because I, I need to, to jump as well in a few minutes. But uh, just to finish on that idea, like when you see the, 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 the TV show ends, you see actually the, uh, that the, the community around it, uh, like you see two effects, like first, because, because the end you know that at some point it will come that the TV show will end. You anticipate for that, right? So it, it for for first time, as soon as it ended, it reinforced the the, the cult around it, uh, and then and then it dissolved it. It becomes like, you know, I don't know, maybe twofold stronger, and then it it it, it disappears. In it doesn't it, it disappear, disappear itself. itself. Like you still have like a you core. Still have a core. That, that stays that, that stays but then but then it, it becomes, it really, becomes diverse, really diverse like like, like new people like will new join people. And, and you know new things will happen around like the you know the, the stories people tell about the the tv show and um it differentiates basically create variation of itself to a point where the the originals those are the at the core don't rec recognize it anymore Right, and this is where you 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 see the deterioration uh, of the of the community, in a sense. Sense. Yeah, 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 I I I remember reading a little bit about Baudrillard and Simulacra, um, those those postmodern thinkers um, have have an interesting um, way of using territory uh, analogy to describe um, not just real space, but also um, these, these very difficult to define spaces like, uh, like ideology. Um, the, the, the notion of this TV programming, which is basically the medium, right? In which the, the writer 
uses the actors as a medium first of all and then uses puts it on film and then the broadcasting you know these are mediums within mediums within mediums interacting with one another but the writer has an intent which is to again like you say they they put in and design within this show the plot and the the costumes obviously and and even the actors even put in some of their own intentions into it. The um the the design of love, right? They they have to be um they have to put in something that's very special into it for the audience to uh have an engagement that's um that's felt after the show is over. Um because because you know the 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 stark reality is a life without ideology, a blank canvas is very boring. And so it is the natural tendency of that blank canvas to find an artist or painter, right? And this is why celebrity worship is also one of those things too, is, you know, we, we have many, many blank canvases um, who, who, who are trying to look for, you know, their, their husband or wife, right? You know, trying to find love. And in the absence, or probably because of disappointment or from bad experiences of, of trying to find matching pairs, right? You know, Plato, Plato describes that the soul um, is two people, right? Two soul mates comprise one soul. And, and it's because, you know, primordial primordially all souls have been divided into two you know a male and a female part and in which way in many ways you know platonic idealism is actually very quite similar to Taoist yin yang and um and another interesting thing yeah. about you know the, the, the we mention quite often right in our in our discussions about design that one that the only way to really inquire um something new to innovate right is to look at what it currently is and then dig deeper but how how do you dig deeper you find its opposite and then you keep on iterating through that you know through through different iterations and variations right and then you you basically just multiply up from two to four to eight and onwards and then when you when, as soon as you scale up the variations you realize the patterns and similarities and then you, and then you figure out, um, you know what what the space that is available to work with, right? To optimize for, or to, uh -huh. you know, to to find a pattern in which you want to develop, because maybe you just want to have something that's cyclical, right? So that way you can always come back home, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, this is where I wanted to go with this idea of. Okay, I we use the term cult, but it's it's obviously too strong for <laughs> what we, I guess I, I assume what we are really discussing, but you know, uh, creating it and dissolving it for the purpose of being in that in this kind of oscillation, like you you create and you dissolve and you create and you dissolve it, um, for like you know constructing this creating this territory and you know not wait until it's it's impossible to to breathe anymore because you have no fresh air and purposefully like opening it opening it to to fresh air just to recreate a new one out of it like you know like you know some, some kind some, of some um, kind of um yeah i don't i don't two, two well so two um uh meetups ago we were kind of talking about a little bit of like politics right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and even though we're talking about territory of opening up and dissolving it in a very metaphysical ideological sense mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. in in some ways i think reality matches metaphysics quite often and in in i think you know like in ancient chinese or in eastern philosophy you have this idea of the mandate of heaven right where yeah. there yeah. are dynasties that rise and then they collapse and it's not it's not that you should go against the collapse you should allow it to collapse because that is the natural part of the of the cycle 
of, of, of the yin and yang. Yes. Yes. And this is one, of, this the, is one of the of the position of the position of the of the, um, of the, of the, of the You know, I don't know if you heard of it, uh, but there's some people basically um, saying that we are on the on the age of a, of, of a collapse, like a, of a, a civiz, civilizational collapse. Uh, but it shouldn't be, you know, taken as this uh, apocalyptic uh, thing, like which is really encoded in, in the Western philosophies because, because of, of, because of, 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 religion, of the religion, right? Right. But, uh, but uh, as uh, something as... that is needed for 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 the cycle to continue, right? Which is something that is something that is maybe maybe even wanted. Even wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think when you when you build. Uh, a, a growth engine that is based upon a GDP metric that is inherently flawed. Um, I I think that you've bred the 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 reasons for your collapse, you know, forty years ago, right, or sixty years ago, um, and, and you know the 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 inventor of the GDP metric uh, himself didn't didn't think that that is what you should use to, you know, yeah, grade yeah. the economic productivity of, uh, of, of countries, but yeah. Even the, the, Even reason, the, the why reason why the GDP, GDP exists is a uh, uh, story, funny story actually. actually. Right. It, it was just after World War II, right? The, uh, the Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 just it's just for, uh, like it was a, like it was a temporary thing. That would help, would help the situation, the situation right? right? Yeah, understand, yeah. understand the situation. Yeah. And and not only that, but the Bretton Woods was mired with controversies of the gamesmanship and basically like, uh, you know, playing, baiting um, your allies into thinking that it was a gold um, currency yeah. reserve. Yeah. But then you just like in the last minute, you put in dollar instead. <laughs> and then... Um, and then you're like forever pegged to a system, right? So yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's another thing too, is that World War II, the, the victors created their own cult, right? And, and then as soon as the power players got what they wanted in terms of the, the treaties or whatnot, the cult got dissolved. And, 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 and we live in the deterioral deterritorialization after effects of that 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 dark pact <laughs> of the cult of the power cult though right like they at the yeah. end of the day yeah. they were leaders of countries that fought wars and you know made agreements right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's today though i don't think we respect um the utility functions or the the reasoning behind um, how all those agreements have been made, but I think, you know, for the sake of, I think the narrative of stability, we choose to keep those promises anyways. Um, and I think we will continue to do a little bit of that even post collapse, uh, just for, just for the sake of, I, I don't know, of of nostalgia maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah probably, probably because, because 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 like until like until new patterns, new patterns replace, replace truly, truly the old the one, old one you have you like have a, a delay right in the in the system in the response. system's response yeah latency right you have yeah. you have some um, some cultural latency if you will like yeah. if yeah. if you if you bring in you know an immigrant to a new country there is language latency. Yeah. If you if you still still uh, use the um, the the territory and assemblages uh, uh, idea a uh, concept um, to explain it, um, it, it's it's the like it's the remaining of what created the the coupling effects like processes and rituals and things we do, uh, not because. It, it has a utility for us directly, but we perceive it as a utility for the whole, uh, for the assemblage. In fact, as soon as the assemblage disappear because we, because it's, it, it, you know, it fell apart, uh, 
because of the collapse. Um, um, you still you have, still have... The, the remaining of those rituals, right? Uh, which serve the, the, the prior uh, assemblage. But now, in this transitional phase, you, you have a new one that is forming. Uh, and like the collapse is not a, a point in time, right? It's a, it's more like a, a gradient. It's a, a, a spectrum of, of things that happens uh, not in a linear way uh, until you 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 reach uh, a, a new a new normal, right? Um, um, and it and... Like, takes time, right? But... Right, but you know, it's it's kind of like. Um... The question is, what do you do with all the amino acids that have, uh, you know, folded into proteins that were supposed to be used of the previous era, right? Um, I think, I think, not only are we going to cause waste, but we will cause mm. pain too. And yeah, un yeah until, un we, until we we know how to, how to use all the them, right? Right. Yeah. Well, the the thing is. Even if you plan for a graceful collapse, <laughs> it will not happen. <laughs> the re true. reality will subvert point. your plans. So the, the mm. question is, you know, how do you how how do you uh, subvert your own expectations? Basically, you just don't have any expectations, but you still yeah. want to be yeah. hopeful, right? And and this is actually kind of a key thing here too is. Um, one of the one of the reasons why uh, life seems to work is because DNA, when it's complete, right, is 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 just the chain. But when DNA needs to replicate, it breaks in half, and then th these codons go three at a time, and it just basically maps out the other half, right? Because because whatever it is in one half you can get a perfect replication uh, from RNA to DNA. And so mm -hmm. in, in many ways, in, so you know, to kind of go back to assemblage theory, this is how anything really grows, right? If something is stable, not, not perfectly stable, but like workable, right? Then it has permission to take resources and then replicate. Yes. Right. Yes. Nobody it's, gave it permission. It's, like it's not God given permission, but it's it's that it has the ability to take codons and use the resources to yeah. to reduce yeah. entropy. This is and, coherence. This is coherence. It's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, and life itself is you know paperclip maximizing in a sense, right? Nick Bostrom mm -hmm. ta talks about you know uh, this thought experiment of of a paperclip maximizer. You know, you want to make an AI that optimizes for something that is somewhat tedious at first, right? Something that doesn't really affect you, and uh, that um, that that you can you can prove that AI uh, it can be can be better than a human, but you you don't allow it to go beyond the bounds, right? Of 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 your control, but then. The absurd conclusion of a paperclip op optimizer is if this paperclip optimizer really was superhuman some, somehow, it would turn the universe into just a bunch of paperclips. It would turn humans into paperclips. Like we would, we would be extinct anyways, right? So, so in some ways, this, this thought experiment also failed its own, you know, the, the, the question that I was trying to answer, which was how do you build a safe AI? Right. Hmm. Mm. Maybe, 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 maybe there's something. There's because something because you know we discuss you know, this, um, this, um, Jonathan. Jonathan. Uh, uh, we discussed time to time about jobs to be done and about that theory of how to achieve innovation and stuff like that. Uh, about about goals, right? Um, um, and we and discuss, we discuss quite, quite often, often about, about the fact that, the fact that there's okay. some things. Where, where the goal is the not goal that is... obvious, right? It's it's not a, a, um, it's not a, that of a, a directed goal. It's um, it's a goal without really um, like it's more like an intent without the goal, 
right? Right. In that sense. Right. In that sense. Yeah. So remember earlier, I was kind of talking about how Euler came up with graph theory because of the Kernigsberg problem, right? Um, so you 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 just you can deconstruct that and just saying you know you have a naive prob problem maker or a naive question, mm -hmm. and then you have a genius problem solver, and then the result was you get a tool. So you don't really get a solution, but you get a generalized solution, which is a tool mm -hmm. that gives you generalized solutions, a solver instead of the solution, right? Yeah. yeah. And in some cases, that's probably the best result is to get a tool, right? Because just solving the specific problem of, oh, this will never happen, and I'm not going to prove it to you because I don't want to, or it's not worth my time, that's not a sufficient um, enough. And I think, you know, when it comes to different complexity problems, problems that won't have solutions, but you can still get tools or problems yeah, that yeah. you can get solutions, but you won't get tools because, you know, it's, it's one where even if you have a naive questioner and you have a good, you know, tool maker, um, the problem doesn't yield itself to a to to to, to tool making, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so it, it's more of just you use existing tools. Um, <clears throat> but if, but if, if, we, if we use, use for, um, a safe AI, it would be, be an AI, an AI that that's not meant, not to, meant to have a goal. Have a goal. As we, as we, as we, as know, we, like a, you know, a direct, goal. A direct goal. Yeah, it's it's to maximize paper clips, but not kill humans. But <laughs> you don't know if it will kill humans if it reaches a certain state of its paper clip entropy minimizing operations. That's true. That's true. We don't know. We but don't in, know. But in, in all cases, we don't case. know, right? Right. Correct, but but see that is one of the results that would completely subvert um, your your expectations. <laughs> because yeah, I, because I, at, yeah, some, I like, at some I like, point, because like like at some point, resources will have to be competed against, and then they will they will discover what the competition is and proceed to eliminate that. You mean from the AI, AI perspective? perspective? Yes, yes. For instance, if you have to use metals that the AI uses to build paper clips, then it would reason that you're an obstacle hmm. to, to in 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 order to make more paper clips, right? Yeah, because yeah, because, because, because it has this clear goal of making more paper clips, right? And and so this is. This is a very interesting point, which is that this thought experiment is not just about AI, but it's actually about our own collapse, right? We have created a GDP paperclip maximizing tool of, of an economy that we all religiously believe in, you know, in, in terms of a, as a global collective cult, right? Um, and, and we would destroy ourselves because we're, we're the sentient yeah. AI. Yeah. Um, the yeah. macro body AI that, that maximizes you, paper clips. You know, uh, in many ways, I, I do perceive uh, that uh, business and finance and uh, religions are way more in common than, than what we usually discuss. Um, and then, like, the, the unreasonable unreason aspect of it is, um, is one that, is, that characterizes all of them in a, a, a in a good way. I mean, not in a good like it, it's, like not, good, it's not good. Uh, well, but, yeah. Uh, so, so in in every single one of these disciplines, right? You have higher, you know, you have your natural eighty twenty rule Pareto's, right? So you have like your, your uh, best sorry, performance. Sorry, sorry, I don't hear you well. So in each one of these, yeah. each in each one of these um, uh, arenas, right? You have your eighty twenty rule. Pareto's, right? So you have your elites, your elite practitioners, and you have your your kind of like cult followers, so to speak. And they're basically sheep, right? For 
for for the elites to to call and to get resources to re- regenerate itself, right? Um, and you would have to say that the the elites have to have some kind of operating principle in which they have to be careful stewards because if they over harvest, then that's gone, right, for good. Mm-hmm. But if they harvest at the correct rate, then they they can maximize their utility function that way. There is so this this principle of harvesting or being good stewards, right, is is how to maximize your utility um, without the risk of ruin. And um, and and in many ways, this is the kind of the reason why. You know, finance is very, uh, at least high finance is actually very close to just gambling, right? It's it's risk minimization, but also with, you know, high convexity bets, right? So essentially, it it, it is just, it's it's essentially just gambling, but controlled gambling, system systematic risk controlled gambling. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, and it's a number, and it's a game, number right? game. Like the, 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 the more you have, have at the beginning, at the beginning and the less, and less risk, in reality. risk in reality, right? Yeah, and people make categorical mistakes, right? So a big categorical mistake is um, believing that. So there, categorical means that you just mistake in categories of of one thing for another. So you have. Let's say, for example, we create three categories of data, information, and intelligence, right? Your, your data is what you get from senses, from your reports, from numbers. The, the information is when you sort the data in order of what's the best, what's the worst, right? And, and all these different characteristics and properties, you can sort it. And then you, ha- you can build thousands of different lists, you know, the best GDP, the, the, the most beautiful sceneries, the best democracy, the best education. You know, you, you sort all the countries, sort all the people, everything. That's your information. And then your intelligence is what does the information lack? Where are the biases in the data? That's your intelligence. It's what is missing. Af, you know, it's, it's your exclusion. Even though you have a lot, there is still something missing that can you know completely change whatever you've decided to model right and i think a categorical mistake is if you mistaken information for intelligence right that Mm, you don't need to think anymore because you have so much information that it's enough to to replace intelligence and so that would be one mistake another would be to assume that I mean, this is a very obvious one that that your data is sorted enough, right? That y- your unsorted data is as good as information, and you can just allow intelligence and data uh, to to work alone and not have information in between. That that would be a mistake on a very stupid level because you're asking, you know, your your decision maker to look at very messy data, which wastes wastes their time, right? That's a very that's a very low level categorical mistake, but you know, you, you understand how that works. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think categorical mistakes are the ones that we are very prone to making because of what analytical philosophy has kind of done to our brains. We mistaken a lot of meaning and context into words like efficiency. When I say efficiency, um, and then I ask two people, what do they think about it? They'll give me different answers. Uh, nobody has a def- th- nobody believes in the dictionary definition of efficiency, right? They, we all have our own personal ones that is rooted in our ideology, so to speak. It's ve- actually very hard to extract a word like efficiency out, out of your ideology, right? That it actually comes deep within your ideology. So, um, you know, like a world is very, very carefully crafted. And that's one of the reasons why I think in your territory um, analogy that it's very important to have multiple passports. You know, you, <laughs> you want to be able to fluidly interpret languages 
mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. communities and their their worldview into you so then that way you do not get stuck with making categorical mistakes yeah i agree yeah yeah we, we yeah something with boundaries is that um like they they have um they have porosity uh it's not borders it's it's you know boundaries so they have necessary porosity but they let go they let through inf- some information but not all the information so you have some points where between territories uh you have like some kind of overlaps uh and this is if you seek for um you know um transposability of information uh as a way to gain knowledge um then this is the the kind of place you, where you want to to be right right uh, uh i'm i was a petroleum engineer so i i understand how to mathematically model porosity permeability flow like if you want to model it quantitatively you know let me know cuz i i still remember uh how to do some of that you know from a well bore and 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 and, and building that, that stuff out that, that, that would be that would be really interesting to to try to with, try with something, something else something else than than geology, than geology you know? it, yeah exactly right like i i think the key thing is to be one of the key things about having multiple passports is to is to have kind of like the intuition and also the bravery to misapply um <laughs> concepts and bring it to from one field to another um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because you know only then you can actually accidentally you know do what Euler did and discover new things right um i think yeah i yeah. think one of one of the you know like i would say from my experience when i when i built something that was very innovative for you know for another person when when someone who is who i think is intellectually you know uh, smart or you know like a leader in academics or whatever who thinks that something i made was useful was was when i i really worked on something that was original and then i i was curious enough to apply it to his his data set mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. it, then you get a surprising result right yeah yeah yeah, I can I can totally relate to that experience too. Yeah, but uh, this is but what, this what, is I, what meant I meant with, with, with uh, transposability, uh, transposability of information. Of information. Like you, like you, you know that you know that everything that everything about it about will, it will, will apply in another place, place, but but enough, but of, enough of, of, it of it will allow for allow something, for something new, to new to happen. Basically, uh, I'm. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to jump. Uh, 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 the but they again. Again. Really, really interesting. Really interesting. I, it. I love it. All right. See ya. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank yeah. you much. Yeah. Uh, see you next time. Bye. Yeah. See you yeah, next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye.